So when I planned this topic almost a month or so, sometime ago I did not know that today was Mother's Day. <laughs> so I'll adopt what I was going to speak and I'll give some background about why I chose this topic and then I'll try to phrase this. Normally we talk about God as our father. But God is also like the mother. Tomeva mata chapita tomeva. So I'll try to position this talk in that direction. So I was talking with one devotee, young devotee, and he was suffering from severe depression. And he told me that he initially, when he came, before coming to Bhakti, he used to suffer from depression quite a bit. He started chanting Hare Krishna, he started practicing bhakti and dance and sing and his depression went away. But then, after about 3-4 years, about 2-3 years of practice of bhakti, the depression started hitting me more and more. And I asked him what happened. So he said, I just, I just don't like myself. He said, so many things wrong with me and already before coming to Bhakti I knew that there were so many things wrong with me. But now in Bhakti there are so many standards to follow. I can't follow them so I started disliking myself even more. And this is very unhealthy. So he told me no. He said that only when you dislike yourself can you become humble. I said that's quite a distorted way of thinking. So basically, some people, you know, our attitude towards ourselves can go into extremes. Some people are narcissistic. Narcissus was a Greco-Roman character. And he was very handsome. And not only was he handsome, he delighted in beholding his own handsomeness. So once he was passing by, uh, river and he looked at the reflection. Oh, the face is so attractive. He bent forward over the bank to more and more of his body. Oh, the muscles are also good. And he bent forward. And he bent forward. And he did no swimming. So he bent so much that he fell into the river. And he drowned in the river. So, a narcissistic person is one who is drowned in themselves. They just can't think about anything apart from themselves. So such people are, you could say, the supreme eye specialists. <laughs> Not E-Y-E-I, -E -I, but I, Bega, eye specialist. So that kind of self-obsession is definitely unhealthy. Because people can't think of anything except about themselves. Now apart from that, or opposed to that, there can be another kind of people. And these are people who... So these people think too high of themselves. But the other extreme is those who think too low of themselves. Now I'm useless, I'm good for nothing, I'm hopeless, I'm worthless. So these people beat themselves up constantly. And that is also unhealthy. So I'll talk about how we can look at ourselves and whether we can love ourselves. How coming to spiritual life and getting a spiritual understanding of life can change our vision of ourselves. So most of us, we may oscillate between these two. Yes, I am so great. I am so outstanding. Or I am so outstandingly stupid. Like you keep grandiosity and inferiority. Generally, when we look at people, if you feel that I am better than them, it's nice, you see how great I am. And if you look at them and see that they are, they are better than us, inferiority. And this can go to further extremes. So broadly speaking, <clears throat> neither of these attitudes is healthy. And how we can have a balanced view of ourselves in with spiritual knowledge, that will be the topic of my class. And I'll use this with an acronym, HOPE. No, no, that we all need hope in life. 
just as a car needs fuel the human body doesn't just need food now for living in life we need something to look forward to if we have nothing to look forward to in our lives if hope dies then people's purpose motivation for living itself dies so hope is very important and if we compare say a theistic world view and an atheistic world view the problems of life are there for everyone whether we are theists or atheists atheism does not remove any problem of life but atheism only removes the hope that the problems have some purpose that life has some purpose so in that sense hope is what we vitally need so i talk about how bhakti can help us to look at ourselves and look at life with hope so first h is humility so there is a fundamental difference between humility and inferiority or we can have inferiority complex human inferiority complex occurs when we are comparing ourselves with others oh i don't have this i don't have that i don't have that i don't have that the person better than me is that person better than me that. so it the inferiority comes primarily by a comparative mentality now comparison is never unavoidable in life as we live in a competitive society but that comparison shouldn't become the basis of our self identity now humility essentially means that my life is meant to be for something bigger than me humility is not beating oneself down it is not thinking i am useless rather you know i am not that important that my life has to be about me only my life is meant for something higher something bigger than myself but the basis of humility is not self hatred or self loathing the basis of humility is lack of self obsession my life is meant for something more than there are bigger things in life humility comes not by looking down at ourselves but by looking up at something bigger than ourselves there is something bigger than life as it is said humility is not thinking low about ourselves it is thinking less about ourselves don't keep thinking about yourself so in that sense self obsess say self obsession narcissism and self hatred both are actually absence of humility because both are self centered in both of them we are thinking constantly about ourselves and for us if we want humility now shri prabhupad defines humility in the 13th chapter of the bhagavad gita in the 8th where it was made to 12 humility means to not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honored by others to not be anxious to have the satisfaction of being honored by others that means whatever we do is not be so is somebody respecting me or somebody disrespecting me so another way to put humility could be to humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose if we have something important to do then i won't let my ego come in the way so say it is a mother and her child is very sick and some urgent surgery is required now, now they may have had some their some relative is very wealthy but they have had a big quarrel with that and they don't talk with them at all but now at that point if it's a matter of life the child the mother is still saying no, okay please help me this time i say no oh, you disrespected me i don't care you know the worst thing let my child die but i'm not going to no no mother will do it and because there yes one's respect is important but sometimes there's something more than that so humility means that we stop being too self-centered 
Now, if we consider that uh, when we when when we consider, say, from continuing this idea of a mother and a child, the children when they are newborn, they are by nature self-centered, and infants are always right. What that means is, if an infant starts crying at midnight, you can't tell tell that infant, no, that is wrong. <laughs> it doesn't understand that, isn't it? So everybody has to orient their life around the infant, and whatever the infant calls for, if the starts crying at midnight, then the parents wake up and they. The mother may caress the child and maybe feed the child, comfort him, and put him, put him on to sleep again. So the infant, in one sense, is completely self-centered. But as that infant starts growing, then what happens? Infants start understanding. Initially, the infant, uh, the newborn baby, may not even understand if this is my mother. Just oh, this is something soft. And some nice something comes out of it, right? And I drink it. That's all. But as it grows, oh, this is a person. This person loves me. And as it grows further, the child is expected to become conscious, mindful about others. No. So, okay, how you behave? You might make a untidy mess at home, but in front of others, behave properly. You know that you are not the center of the universe. So, in a sense, as the child grows, the child is expected to be conscious of something other than oneself and one's own needs. It's not that one's own needs are to be neglected, but they are not necessarily the center of everything. So, you know, a child, when they are, they just cry any time or they're childish. It's Children are innocent, they are. But if, a over, if you have an overgrown child, somebody who is 18 or 20 or 25 and they are self obsessed, it's, there's nothing likable about them. They are, they are appalling sometimes. So, some children have this entitlement mentality. They think, I want everything. When I want, how I want. So basically, this is, uh, what is happening, I'm talking about humility, I'm not talking about parenting over here, I'm talking about humility. So, self-humility essentially is not about beating oneself down, but coming out of self-centeredness. So, yes, I and my needs and my desires are not the center of the universe. There are other people and their needs, their desires, their concerns also matter. And ultimately, if we consider in bhakti, you will, it is not that, Krishna, if you consider Krishna to be like a mother or a father, now, does, will any mother or father want their child to hate themselves? Obviously not. So if Krishna is the supreme mother, the supreme father, then how would he want for us something that no parent would want for ourselves? So, if we understand that we are parts of Krishna, and if we are meant to love Krishna, the loving Krishna means loving all the parts of Krishna. And one part is I myself. So, if I hate myself or if I dislike myself, then I am disliking a part of Krishna. And that is unhealthy. But simultaneously, if I like only myself and don't care for any other parts of Krishna, that is also not right. So basically, humility means our service, our responsibilities, our duties, what we have to do in life becomes more important than ourselves. That's why I said humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. So we want humility in the sense that not that we keep beating ourselves up that I am worthless, I am worthless, I am worthless. Humility in the sense that no, I am not so important that I have to keep thinking about myself all the time. There are other people, there are other things, 
There are other bigger purposes in life. Let me think about them and let me focus on them. You look around you in your life itself, people who have inspired you in any way. You'll find that most of the times people who inspire, not just people who whom we are dazzled by. Some celebrities they are very self-obsessed, but they have some special music skills or acting skills or whatever. And they may have fans. But somebody who genuinely inspires us, if they are if they're self-obsessed, they don't inspire anyone. It's they are they are living for something bigger than themselves. They have something meaningful to live for. That's what inspires us. So humility, in Bhakti certainly want humility, but humility doesn't mean looking down at us. It means looking up at something bigger than us and molding our life accordingly. So that was the first point about the topic of how to see ourselves. What is the acronym I'm discussing? Oh, yes, thank you. So any comments or questions till now based on this? Yes. You just gave the Greco myth of Narcissus. Narcissus in the story did not drown in the river oh. because a river nymph, a river goddess, found him so beautiful that he, she took him out of the river okay. and he kept loving himself, his reflection in the mirror, and he withered by looking at his reflection. And oh. she was so obsessed with him that the only thing that she could do was stare at him and repeat everything that her, that he said. Her name was Echo. Okay. okay. Echo. So, just like the narcissist, narcissist is narcissist. Echo is the other side of low self-value where she became codependent. Oh, okay. So, this is where she lacked her own self-worth and she withered away with him. <coughs> That's only one yeah. That's so, okay. So in this concept of humility, low self-value, you can't become an echo and just get extrinsic value from someone else. At the same time, can't be obsessed. Try to find the hope in between. What is the discernment between I'm thinking too much of myself or I'm not thinking at all? Yeah, good question. So, what is the balance between I am not thinking about ourselves at all or I thinking too much about ourselves? I think it's a, it's a based on, I'll come to H O P E when I come to P, we are going to talk about purpose at that time. I'll come at that point, but I'll mention it briefly. It's essential that we, at a basic level, take care of ourselves. If, say, if we don't feed ourselves, if we don't rest, if we don't take care of ourselves, then we won't even take care of anyone else. Eventually others will have to take care of us. If somebody is drowning and uh, I don't know how to swim and I jump into the river to save them. Well, far from saving them, somebody else will have to jump in to save me. So, it's, there has to be a basic understanding of what are the needs which are there for my basic existence or survival. So it could be physical needs, it could also be emotional needs. And if we keep giving ourselves too much, then there is what is called as compassion fatigue. And we just keep thinking about others, keep thinking about others, but then we get drained out completely. So we need to do also those things that nourish ourselves. So the point is that if we can consider our body and mind to be like a vehicle, we don't want to just keep decorating the vehicle to make it very attractive. But at the same time, we can't neglect the vehicle so much that there's no fuel in it, there's no tire, the air in the tire, and we're driving it. So we see ourselves as vehicles for something higher to manifest through us. And that's what I'm talking more about purpose. But with that understanding, our needs have to be taken care of, and sometimes our needs may have to be taken care of before we can take care of others' needs. But we, we don't stop with our needs and our desires for the rest of our life. Just like say if, a, if there's an emergency in a plane, they say we went to Paris, 
They put on the oxygen mask first on yourself, then put it on your child. So there are times when we need to take care of our, our needs also. But it's more purpose centered. Because if somebody else is also, somebody else is too self centered, then by pandering to their needs, we prevent them from growing. So there are times when we, especially when somebody is very small and immature, there is a love that guards. When the parents stand right next to the child and they protect the child from whatever consequences of their bad actions they might do away with. But then, as the child grows, that love has to change from the love that guards to the love that guides. That means that, okay, this is right, this is wrong. And sometimes the worst thing that we can do for others is to protect them from the consequences of their actions. Sometimes if they have done something wrong, the consequences need to hit them. That's when they learn. And codependency, codependency and addiction is exactly the same thing. The codependent keeps clearing the mess that the addict has done. And that way the addict keeps going on and on indulging. And the codependent thinks, I am doing so much for the addict. But actually the codependent is facilitating the addiction. So there are times in love when we need to let people whom we love suffer the consequences of their actions. Because that's how they will learn. So we're discussing hope. So H was humility. <clears throat> so as we move forward, our topic basically is how do we look at ourselves positively? Or how do we look at ourselves within a spiritual context? And O is continuous the theme of hope, optimism. The now the world is at one level, a place where everybody can very easily become discouraged. So many things can go wrong in our lives. So many things we may ourselves are do wrong. We might ourselves do wrong, and it's very easy to sink into negativity. And some people find solutions to all problems, and some people find problems with all solutions. So there are different kinds of people. Now, optimism doesn't mean an unrealistic thinking that oh everything is all right. But optimism means that we we have the basic confidence that each one of us can make a difference. In, in the whole world might be a dark place, but we can create a light at least in our hearts. We can create a light around us. Every one of us can make a difference. It might be a small difference, it might be a big difference. So basically optimism centers, not by optimism, not really that everything is wonderful, but optimism here is that each one of us has, our existence has some value. That our existence has some value and by our existence, we, by our existence, we can make some difference. And that's why this, this understanding of optimism actually centers on responsibility. So optimism is not, oh, everything is fine. That, that's not really optimism. Some people say that there is a Gita Sar, the essence of the Gita. And in many places in India, they put it in their shops and homes. So, जो हुआ वो अच्छा हो, जो हो रहा है वो अच्छा हो, जो होने वाला है वो अच्छा ही हो। Whatever happened was good, whatever is happening is good, whatever will happen will also be good. Well, that sounds good. Now I have recited the Bhagavad Gita hundreds of times, read it, read it dozens and dozens of times. I haven't found any words in the Gita that comes anywhere close to this. Now. Primarily, the Gita is not about what happens. The Gita is centered on what we are meant to do. So it is a focus on dharma. Dharma means the right thing to do. That 
what am I meant to do? What is the right thing for me to do? Krishna is asked, being asked by Arjuna in 2.7. Now, am I saying that whatever, that everything that happens is not good? No, that's not exactly what I'm saying. Actually, in life, bad things do happen sometimes. And if something terrible has happened, somebody's got a, someone has got a crippling disease, somebody has suddenly lost their fortune, somebody has lost a loved one. Now, it's actually very insensitive to tell somebody who's gone through a tragedy, jo hua hua <laughs> whatever has happened is good. No. Bad things do happen in life. When, when Sita was abducted, uh, nobody told him whatever happened is good. Isn't it? Now, then if we say what is then what is God, what, are, what is God's control? Shape? What is God's love? Everything that happens is not good. But everything that happens can be for good. There's a difference between the two. God is so expert that even when bad things happen, He will bring good out of the bad. And that is what we see say, repeatedly in the Mahabharata or the Ramayana. The Pandavas, they were, they were tempted to be burned alive and they had to flee into the forest. But through that, they got to, got to go, went to Draupadi Swayamudra, got the hand of Draupadi. And they became allied with one of the most powerful kingdoms at that time. They had gone alone as orphans, but they came, as allies, came back as allies of a powerful king. So through bad, good can happen. And we can be a part of manifesting that good. So optimism is not naive. Everything that happens is good. No. Bad things happen. But good can come out of the bad. And we can, each one of us can play a role in bringing out the good even from the bad. So the, the optimism that the Bhagavad Gita tells at one level, if you see the Bhagavad Gita is spoken on a war field where, where bloodshed is going to happen. But the Bhagavad Gita's optimism is that is not a naive optimism. That everybody is a soul, everybody is in the journey of spiritual evolution. Arjun, if you do the right thing, you will evolve and you will help others evolve. So basically, <clears throat> I was at an interfaith conference in Washington DC recently and there one there was a Jew, Jewish rabbi he was saying that in one of our old traditions they say that next to every grass every blade of grass is an angel who is whispering to that grass grow, grow, grow. This, similarly in that tradition we believe that next to every soul is an angel who is urging to that soul evolve 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 so at one level, that we can understand in the super soul. As God who is present in our heart. God wants each one of us to evolve. So optimism essentially means that we all have the capacity to evolve. So some people say that, that there is, uh, just accept yourself as you are. Yes, self-acceptance in the sense is we shouldn't be hating ourselves. But to think that I am perfect the way I am, and that is, it is not only unrealistic, it is also narcissistic. Each one of us has so many painful inadequacies. We might cover them up, we might pretend that we are, we are competent. But we, all of us, we are finite beings. So all of us has, have inadequacies that we know. So, optimism doesn't mean I am perfect the way I am. If self-love means that, oh, I am perfect. That is terrible. But if optimism means, okay, I have issues right now, but I have the potential to evolve. I have the potential to evolve and there is God next to me in my heart. Sarvasya Chaham, Radhisan, Nivishto. There is God next to me in my heart and He will help me to evolve. And this is the essential message of the Bhagavad Gita. That every one of us is a spark of divinity. And because everyone is a spark of divinity, so 
So everyone has within them the issue to evolve. And this, in one sense, if again going back to the idea of mother's love, see a mother loves the child as the child is. But the mother also loves what the child can do. And the mother trains, disciplines, guides the child that the child can become what they can be in the future. So this, this love of the mother has two aspects. The mother cannot hate the child as it is. It has to love and care for the child as, as the child is right now. But they also, also have to see what the potential and help the child to grow the potential. So that is Krishna's attitude towards us. Krishna accepts us as we are right now. Krishna's love is not conditional. He doesn't say, unless you care for me, unless you are my devotee, unless you are purified, I don't care for you. You are not my devotee, I'll leave your heart and go away. Krishna is not like that. Krishna is there in everyone's heart. But at the same time, Krishna accepts us as we are at present, as we are at present, but Krishna also prods us to develop our potential. So optimism means we have the potential to evolve. And optimism also means that there are higher powers which are there to help us to evolve. So you could say that when we love ourselves, it is like a parent's love for a child. There is self-acceptance. There is acceptance. Yes, I love you as you are. But there is also aspiration. There is so much more you can become. And that applies to each one of us. So that is optimism. Any comments or questions about this? Okay, so yeah. Is God running the bad side of the story as well? Is God running the bad side of the story as well? There are three factors of action in the world. There is God's will, there is free will, and there is evil. <laughs> So what do I mean by evil? Evil is not exactly like an independent existence. Evil is basically the fossilized impressions within us which keep pushing us in particular directions. So God is the supreme controller. Nothing happens without his sanction. But he has given each one of us his free will. And within the jurisdiction of free will, he doesn't interfere. So he is the supreme controller, but he is not the sole controller. There is a Parameshwara and Ishwara. So each one of us is also an Ishwara in small way. Now, some of us, by our past karma, may have a small circle of influence. Some of us may have a big circle of influence. Say, if we get angry, now we might just speak some harsh words to someone. But say, some head of state who has nuclear weapons at their buttons, they get angry. They can kill thousands of people. So what has happened? By past karma, their kshetra, their area of influence is bigger. Now if somebody misuses their free will and does something wrong within their area of influence, then it is not God doing that. It is that person misusing their free will to do that. If God were controlling everything that everyone did, then all the evil that happens in the world, it would be God causing that. And if, it God, if the supreme being were causing that, then that supreme would not be God, that supreme would be the devil. So God is not the cause of the bad things in the world. So there are each of us has free will and we have certain jurisdiction for some time based on our past karma. Somebody might be head of state for 5 years, might be dictator for 20 years. During that time they can do bad, they can do good. And evil means that if somebody has done the same action repeatedly once, twice, thrice, four times, then it becomes they become cold-blooded. They can do it nonchalantly. So when somebody does that, then they can do terrible things without even feeling the slightest pinch of conscience. So there is God's will, which is the supreme governing principle. 
But with by God's will, we all have free will. And by misuse of free will, we create evil within ourselves. We create evil impressions and those impel us to misuse our free will again and again. So the actions done by the misuse of free will under the influence of evil are not done by God. They are done in spite of God. God is within us, prompting us, don't give in to evil. But if you don't listen, then we have to bear the consequences. Okay? So let's move on with. This again goes back to the previous lecture, inclinations and Yes, correct. Okay. So let's move on to. <coughs> we are discussing Chakronim. Oh. oh. So H was? Community. O was? Optimism. 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 P is purpose. Now, purpose is something which we all need in our lives. And many people think that the purpose of life is pleasure. However, pleasure is too cheap a purpose for life. <laughs> what do we too cheap? Says, now, how many of you like jokes? <laughs> the practice is over, who wouldn't like to laugh or just jokes? Now, you know, now with the internet available, we can have, we can 24 hours a day watch comedy shows. Now suppose we had enough financial stability, we didn't have to earn. The rest of our life, we could just spend watching comedy shows. Would we enjoy them? Maybe for some time, but after that, we want something to do, isn't it? So, pleasure is actually too cheap a purpose for life. That doesn't mean that we don't want pleasure. But we want pleasure as a byproduct of something we need. Now, if we choose, if we pursue pleasure itself, almost all the activities where we go about seeking pleasure, those very activities end up giving us trouble. The search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness. And addiction is probably the best example of this. It said with respect to alcoholism, first the drinker takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the drinker. <laughs> so what is happening over here is that the person becomes addicted, they are miserable after that. So, if we think my purpose of life is just pleasure, it's too cheap. That doesn't mean we want trouble, it doesn't mean we want un unhappiness, but pleasure is best experienced as a byproduct of doing something meaningful in life, not just a product of something we do for enjoyment. And another problem with pleasure as a purpose of life is that pleasure is too fragile to sustain us through life's troubles. Because there will be times in our life when there will be so many difficulties and there will be no pleasure. And we all have to go through that. Say if we are studying for a very important exam or a big interview or we have a, we have a very stiff deadline in a project. There is no question of pleasure. It's for work, 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 work. So if pleasure is what is driving us, and that is just something uh, relatively manageable, but sometimes such big troubles can come in our life. So if pleasure alone were the purpose of our life, we will not be able to sustain it. So then what is a purpose that is not too cheap and not too fragile? And that the Bhagavad Gita says is spiritual evolution. The purpose of life is to evolve spiritually. Evolve spiritually means, this is related to optimism in the previous session, that if we are all souls and we are all meant ultimately to love the whole. So, happiness is best experienced when we absorb ourselves in Krishna in a mood of service. So, Krishna is the whole, we are the part. And when we try to serve him, then in that service, in that absorption, satisfaction comes as a byproduct. If while practicing bhakti also we are constantly thinking, am I happy? I am not happy. Am I happy? I am not happy. 
hell, you have to connect with Krishna also. Before, the purpose of life is to serve Krishna and serve everyone in relationship with Krishna. And actually it is purpose that brings meaning and value to our existence. Without a purpose, no, we just ex we just are born, we live for some time. <clears throat> there was a British author, he said, what is man except a bundle of ailments and complaints? <laughs> ailments are in the body, complaints are in the mind. That is our life. But it is only when we have a purpose I do something meaningful. And the Bhagavad Gita tells us, uh, the Bhakti tradition of Lord tells us, that each one of us has this purpose to evolve. And in that purpose, Krishna himself is there to assist us. So we all have certain limitations. But when we try to serve Krishna, when we try to do what we can, God helps us to do what we can't try to do. So we have certain finite capacities and we act accordingly. But when we strive to serve God, He extends our capacity. He does the things which we ourselves would not be able to do. And this purpose is actually the way in which we truly respect ourselves. Now, some people are very obsessed with self-respect. How dare you disrespect me like that? How dare you neglect me? How dare you spoke like that to me? Yes, at one level, none of us wants to be insulted or disrespected. But the real self-respect is not what others show to us. It is what we show to ourselves. And what do we mean by showing respect to ourselves? It essentially means that we regard ourselves as someone who can do something meaningful to make a difference in the world. To make a difference to ourselves, to make a difference to others. And all of us right now, whatever situation we are in, can we make trouble for others? Right now you are sitting, you can turn around and slap the person next to you. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> but, see, if each one of us can make trouble for others, then if we can do bad, then that means we can do good also. And discovering how much good we can do by God's grace, that is life's ultimate adventure. So loving ourselves is not, I am so great, but the supremely great being can act through me, can empower me. And if I try to have a purpose of serving him, of becoming an instrument for the Lord, then he can do so much through me. How much he can do to me, let me discover that. So discovering that is life's ultimate purpose. There are three modes of material nature. There's, which are the three modes? Passion. Goodness, passion, ignorance. So basically with respect to God's will, if you want to say, in the, for God to act through us, you know, if there is a there is some pipe, it can be either a conductor, it can be a semiconductor, it can be an insulator. So the electricity can pass through conductor but not through insulator. So for God's grace to pass through us, if we are in the mode of ignorance, then we are like insulators. Nothing can pass through us. We, we become a part of the problem in the world. When we are in passion, then we are like semiconductor. Something we do. Some good, some bad. But as we come to goodness and move toward transcendence, then we become conductors. And discovering how much good we can do is life's ultimate adventure. So that is P. And related with P is the last E, E is enthusiasm. Now, enthusiasm actually originally comes from the word Theos. Theo, enthusiasm, Theos. Theos is God. So, Entheos means to have good God within you. So, a person who is enthusiastic, normally you think of that person as a lot of energy, vibrancy. Some people are so alive and active. They are like fireballs of energy. So you come near them, you feel energized. So to be enthusiastic ultimately means to have God within us. And the ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate way we can love ourselves in a healthy way is by being on fire 
by being enthusiastic to serve, to fulfill the potential and the purpose that God has instilled in our hearts for our lives. And Srila Prabhupada is probably the best example of being on fire for God. At the age of 69, what did he do? He decided to go to come all the way to America. See, normally everybody, when they are small, they have big ambitions. Say when somebody is 5 years old, 10 years old, they think, I'll become the next president of America. <laughs> then as they grow up, they say, okay, maybe not president. I'll become the wealthiest person in my country. And as they go further, okay, maybe that's I'll become the wealthiest person in my, my dynasty. No. As they grow further, I'll become the wealthiest person in my family. But life keeps beating, beating, beating. And by the time they graduate, if I get a job, it will be <laughs> So what happens is that life keeps beating us, beating us. And our energy, our spirit, our enthusiasm starts going out of us. When we see the Prabhupada, he faced so many reverses. He tried to start a business. And his purpose was that he wanted to fund his spiritual master's mission. That's why he wanted to have a big business. But somehow people betrayed him, things went wrong, and his business collapsed. Then he tried to start an organization, the League of Devotees. But the same people who were supporting him turned against him. And the place which was going to be his international headquarters, he had to leave that place. He tried to start a magazine. And he was personally printing it, typing it, distributing it, but nobody was interested. He was walking on the streets of Delhi in the summer, and the sun was so hot. He fainted on the streets, and there was no one there. Nobody knew in the whole city who would come and take care of him. Fortunately, Krishna was there, and Krishna sent someone to care of him. But one after another, after that, he faced reverses, and then finally. What is enthusiasm? He said, let me go to America. He says, he had not been able to inspire anyone in India. And how will you inspire anyone in America? So, one of the, the lady who uh, provided him passage on her ship, Sundi Malaji, she told him, Swamiji, how can you go to America? You are so old. And America is so old. <laughs> How will you live there? Prabhupada said, no, this is the purpose of my life. And when he came to America, I think he was 69. Most of the early followers are young hippies between the age of 15 to 25. And they felt that Prabhupada had more energy than them. And so what was this energy? It was not just it was not physical, it was spiritual energy. So, the way we love ourselves is not just by thinking, oh, I am so great, I am so great, I am so great. The, into the, love, the healthy way to love ourselves is to have enthusiasm for serving our Lord. Whatever situation I am in, let me do my best. Enthusiastic. And then we, we are enthusiastic. What happens is that positive energy gradually bubbles over. It goes inside deep into us and it goes outside to others. And it makes a difference. So Chula Prabhupada, when he came in 1965, he's just an unknown old man walking on the Boston Pier to enter into America. <clears throat> but within 12 years, he had traveled all over the world 17, 14 times, he inspired millions of people to evolve spiritually, to learn to live lives of meaning and purpose of contribution and satisfaction. And he had built 108 temples, wrote 70 books. So, what God can do through one dedicated servant, that is Sri Prabhupada's outstanding example of that. So Prabhupada was not there to prove how great I am. His love was for Krishna, and he had that faith that as a part of Krishna, Krishna can act even through me. Krishna can act even through me. So once Prabhupada's Vyas Puja was going on, Vyas Puja is the time when, when uh, the spiritual master is respected uh, as the representative of God for having brought God's message into our life. So there were people who were you know, doing his aarti and somebody was washing his feet and there's a disciple next to him 
who, who was fanning him and he heard Prabhupada speak something. Now this can seem to be like a very, very arrogant position to be in. People are worshipping you and washing your feet. And Prabhupada spoke something and Sepul just bent forward and your Prabhupada was saying, Krishna, just see how your dog has been worshipped. So Prabhupada was thinking, I am such a great spiritual master. He was thinking, he was thinking about Krishna. And he said, I am simply a servant of Krishna. So when he said, I am a dog for Krishna, that was not a self-deprecating sense. In the sense that, even through me, Krishna, you have acted in such a wonderful way that so many people are inspired by. So for us, the more we become Krishna-centered, the more our life becomes centered on Krishna as the object of our love, as the object of service, then we will find that our life will become permeated with positivity towards ourselves and towards the world at large. So that is the healthy way in which we all can love ourselves. I'll summarize. I spoke today on this topic of can we love ourselves? So I talk, started by talking about how some people may misunderstand humility to hating oneself or looking down at oneself. But I talked about the hope acronym H was humility. So humility is not so much looking down at ourselves as looking up at something bigger than ourselves. So humility means that we don't let our ego come in the way of our purpose. We don't. We understand that there are bigger things in life than me. And as we grow, we start thinking more and more of those bigger things. A baby is always self-centered. It doesn't even know about others' existence. But as the baby grows, it's expected to think about others. Similarly, as we evolve, we in humility that means not that we beat ourselves down or look down at ourselves, but that. We look at something bigger than ourselves and focus on that as the center and center of our life. And what is that bigger thing? That the Bhagavad Gita reveals to be God. O was what? Optimism. Optimism, Optimism doesn't mean simply that everything is good. Uh, everything is good. Optimism means that we each of us are a part of the divine. So even if I have many bad things around me, at my core, there is a divine spark. There is spiritual potential. That we have the potential to become better than what we are right now. And optimism also means that with us there is God who is there to help us when we try to become better. So just like a parent loves their child as they are right now, but the parent also looks forward to the manifesting the child's potential. So similarly, self-love means we accept ourselves right now, but we also look forward to what we can become, to how we can unfold our potential. So that each of us can make a difference, that our life comes, that we, no matter how small we may be, we have the potential to make a difference, that is optimism. And P is purpose. So I talk about how pleasure is too cheap and too fragile a purpose to sustain us through life. We could just watch comedies for the rest of our life. We get bored soon. We want something stimulating. And if too much troubles come in our life, there's no pleasure we feel. What is the point of it? But purpose comes by taking up responsibility for something bigger than ourselves. And when we take up that responsibility, and pleasure comes as a byproduct, not as a product. And when we look for pleasure, we get trouble. The search for happiness is often the cause of the greatest unhappiness. So the purpose that the Bhagavad Gita tells us is to evolve, spiritually evolve. Evolve in our capacity for wisdom and our capacity for devotion. And that means that every one of us can become a channel for God to act through us. That brought us to the last part of E was Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm means to have God within us. And to be on fire with God's presence within us. And that God can act even through us. That is something which can energize us no matter how much darkness there might be around us. And life's ultimate adventure is to discover how much good we can do when we strive to live in harmony with God. When, God. when we get out of God's way within our heart, 
instead of being an insulator or any conductor, when we become a conductor, we know we all can do bad. But how much good can we do? And discovering that is life's ultimate adventure. And opening ourselves to that adventure is the healthy way to show self-respect. Not by demanding that others respect me, but by respecting myself as a vehicle by which something bigger than me can act through me. And readying myself to become that vehicle. That is the healthy way to respect ourselves, to love ourselves. And we conclude with Sri Prabhupada's example of how he, even at an old age when most people would be jaded with repeated reversals in life, he was in, on fire and he did a miraculous thing in the last 12 years of his life, infusing millions and billions with higher consciousness. And he is an example of a healthy self regard by which each one of us can become a vehicle for the divine to make a positive difference in the world. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Do we have time for questions about anything? Okay, any questions? Yes, please. Secondly, in nature also, even, in, even 
living beings, they have a basic purpose to survive. So in our observation, everything that has consciousness has some purpose. So if this is what we observe around us, why should in the big picture there be no purpose? It's only reasonable that one of the basic principles of knowledge in science is induction. That we observe things around us and we infer that this is how it is in the big picture or universal. So if we can see in our day-to-day -day conduct as well as in nature, living beings move purposefully. So if there is a short-term purpose, why should there not be a long-term purpose? And overall, researchers have found out that people who live as if there is a purpose to life, they live healthier and better. There is one of the best books of the 21st century, in the fundamental perspective, is Man's Search for Meaning by, <clears throat> by a Jewish psychiatrist, Victor Frankl, who was trapped in the uh, concentration camps. And he said that in these humiliating conditions, the people who survived were not necessarily the people who were the fittest. Even skinny, weak people survive if they had some purpose for them. So even from the medical perspective, it's been more or less documented that if somebody has a purpose, then uh, they survive better in life. So just as physical nutrition is our need, similarly, metaphysical orientation is also our need. And if there is no metaphysical orientation to life, People collapse into themselves. They, they just they hurt themselves and they hurt others. So logically, it makes sense to have purpose. Empirically or experientially, living as if there is purpose is healthier than living as if there is no purpose. So we could say that you cannot empirically, you cannot conclusively say that life has a purpose, but we can reasonably infer that. And if somebody says there is no purpose, on what basis are you saying that? It is just your self-centered extrapolation about the nature of the world that there is no purpose to it. This doesn't make sense. Okay? Thank you. This is my last question. Okay. Yeah, please. For enthusiasm, you gave the example of Sita Prabhupada. Prabhupada came to the US in 69. Very true. But at the age of 69, he had already uh, gotten the strength of, you know, Siddhapati uh, Siddhanta Swami. He spent years in Rajdhan, you know, getting that, that spiritual strength. And even when he had his two heart attacks, he had the dream, and right there is the painting, of Krishna himself saying, no more heart attacks for you, I will be with you. That's some pretty strong stuff to keep your enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And even when he was being worshipped, when they were saying Srila Prabhupada, he was thinking of his own Guru Day. He was thinking of Bhakti Siddhanta because that was his name, Prabhupada. Nobody else was before that. Right? But what do we do as us, as me, where I don't have being raised? you know, with a little, with a little uh, Jagra Yatra, where I was not with a lot of devotees that actually held that faith. In fact, I saw, I have more friends that have fallen and left than have stayed. How do I keep that enthusiasm, that optimism against an atheist that says, see everything that did wrong? How do we keep it? It's a very genuine question, but the Prabhupada had Krishna coming in his dreams, he had the devotional upbringing, he had lived in Vandal. So that, all that gave him strength to persevere in his enthusiasm. But when we don't have that, we have our friends who have left the path of bhakti. And how do we keep our enthusiasm? See, for all of us, we could say that in our life, there is there are facilities and there are responsibilities. So we all can uh, make a list of the ways in which we have been deprived of necessary facilities. Mm -hmm. And nowadays many people feel victimized. And it is true. Life is, life is tough. 
by the stuff and you know, I've traveled across the world and met many, many successful people. Just scrap a little bit on the surface, below their facade, and everyone is working through their own tragedies. So somebody who has a relative who has recently died of cancer, somebody who has a parent who is suffering from Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, or somebody is, you know, their, their partner has betrayed them. So many things. Everybody is going through their own tragedies, somehow working through it. So, and sometimes we, we see people doing terrible things. And we may think, we may be horrified. How could they do such a terrible thing? But you know, if we actually went into their lives and saw all that they've gone through, we would, we would not be horrified why they are so bad. We would be surprised why they are not worse. <laughs> so it's, life is tough in the world. So we can, each of us has a choice that that there are so many, so many things which, which I have been deprived of. These facilities I did not get. So we can look at that and just feel disempowered. So either we can we can claim rights, or we can choose responsibilities. Choose responsibility. Okay, I am in this situation. What responsibility can I take up right now to make things better? To make myself better, to make others better, to make things a little better. And you know, claiming our rights is important, but what do you do after getting your rights? If, if we have not developed an ethos of responsibility, it is getting a right doesn't make things right actually. Freedom can be very disorienting for those people who don't have the responsibility, sense of responsibility to use the freedom property. Imagine from say tomorrow, if we had nothing to do for the next one month or next one year, no work, no job, no family responsibility, just do whatever you want. Unless we had some very strong driving sense of purpose, so we would just watch TV and surf on the internet, and make ourselves into a vegetable basically. So, you know, it's it's of course we all have been deprived. And if we had more facilities, it would have been wonderful. But we we, we have that choice, either I can complete either I can resent the things that didn't work right in my life, or I can choose to take responsibility. And if we do that, if we take responsibility in whatever situation we are in, then we can make a difference. It might be small, but we can make a difference. So yes, Prabhupada had some powerful spiritual experiences in terms of Krishna coming in his dream instead of being in Vrindavan. But you know, he had equally powerful uh, negative experiences. It is his, none of his god brothers came forward to help him even in the least bit. So, actually, say if we are being, we are being criticized from some, by someone, the harshest words of our critics don't hurt us as much as the silence of our friends. And Prabhupada was going through so much and not hardly any of his god brothers actually came to help him. So it was very disappointing for him. So he got great power spiritual experiences, very great spiritual upbringing also. But he had heavy spiritual, heavy difficulties also which he went through. So we, we can, at our level, just try to take responsibility for doing whatever good we can in our situation. And ultimately Krishna is a reciprocal. If we take up responsibility, Krishna will give us more facility. And as we use that facility responsibly, Krishna will give us more. In general, the history of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, and you could say the history of spiritual movement in the world at large, change has always happened in the sidelines. Sidelines means that Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati that Bhaktivinoda Thakur, 
was not born in a Gaudiya Vaishnava family. He was born in a Shakta family. He was outside the Gaudiya Vaishnava orthodoxy. But through that outside position, he rejuvenated Gaudiya Vaishnavas. Srila Prabhupada was outside the Gaudiya uh, hierarchy. Now, he did not get any facility from, him, from the Gaudiya Mat. No assistance, no funds, no contacts also. Nothing. But Prabhupada was in the silence. But Prabhupada took up responsibility and Krishna provided facility. So either we can look at what facility we don't have and just stay where we are or we can take up responsibility in whatever situation we are in. And we take that up, Krishna will give us facility. Thank you very much.